weeks ago, I was standing on a hill, and I was looking down on one side of the hill was this lush green forest. And on the other side of the hill was a town dotted with these small homes. I was in Costa Rica. I had the privilege of going there with a team from this church. We had 22 others of us. Um, It was a women's mission trip, and we went to go and be part of of a mission that we support over there. It's a children's home. And the children that come to that home are there for several different reasons. Some of them are there because their parents are no longer living, they're orphans. And some of the children who are there are there because they've been removed from an abusive situation. And some are there because their parents simply cannot provide a safe home for them. And the first day that we were there, we were sitting in a room, it was just us, the team, and we were looking at this wall, and there were pictures of each child who was there at the home. And we heard their stories, one after another. We heard about how they got there, how long that they were there. And we heard about whether they were in school right now. We got to hear a little bit about their personalities. And so we saw God's hand at work because there were 23 of us and there were 23 children. And so we thought, you know what? What we want to do is provide some one-on-one attention to these children. So many of them have never had that. So that night we went back to um, the place where we were staying and we had the list of the names of children and the list of the team members and we prayed over those names and we just matched them one by one. Then I looked at the name that I had and I saw the name and I, I kept thinking, What was his story? What was his story? And then I remembered. The little boy that I got is eight years old. He has the smile that will melt your heart. And he has a three-year-old little sister who has the biggest brown eyes you just want to fall into. And I was thinking about their story because two years before, they were living in Nicaragua. And their mother could not provide a home for them, so she took them and put them in a boat. She told them to lie down, and she gently took a sheet of plastic, and she put over the children. She pushed the boat into the water, and she, she said, shh. Don't get up. Because she knew that if the boat could make it to the other side of the river, the Costa Rica side, they would be taken and they would be given a new home. Inconceivable what some people will do and sacrifice just to get a better home, isn't it? Yet the Bible is filled with stories of people who do inconceivable things to find a better home. The disciples gave up three years of their life. They were willing to give up their entire life, no matter how long it was, but they gave up three years of their life to follow Jesus. They gave up their jobs, they gave up their families to follow him because they heard his story and they bought it. Hook, line, and sinker, they were sold out for Christ. Whatever you say, Lord, we believe. Wherever you go, Lord, that's where we're gonna go. We are sold out for you. We will do whatever it takes to follow you, Lord. They wanted to teach like he taught. They wanted to serve like he served. They wanted to live like he lived. They wanted to emulate him, the greatest role model you can possibly have. They wanna look like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus. And they did, and then they had an event. Jesus took them and he washed his feet as a good mentor would. He shared dinner with them, and then he made three pronouncements that would blow their minds. He looked at his disciples and he said, Judas will betray me. Peter, 
you're gonna deny me and I'm leaving. What? You're leaving? Yes, I'm leaving and where I go, you cannot go. Wait, what? I don't understand. Lord, you said, follow me. We said, okay, we'll follow you. I mean, well, this is all we've done for three years is follow you. And now you're saying where you're going, we can't follow? I don't understand what that means. And then we hear him explain to the disciples exactly where he's going and why. And today we're gonna be in John chapter 14. If you wanna follow along, we're looking at one of Jesus's I am statements. So for, chapter 14 starts off with this phrase. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Lord, we have been given up three years of our life to follow you. We want to emulate you. We want to live your life. We've given everything for you. And now you've just dropped the bomb on us that you're leaving. And what you say to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Yeah, my, my heart is, is troubled. I have no idea why you are leaving. Imagine yourself. You have connected yourself to a mentor, someone you love and adore. And then he says he's leaving you. Can you imagine the feelings of inadequacy that you would fight? The feelings of failure, maybe? You would put that on yourself. Maybe you're the reason why he's leaving. Certainly, the feelings of uncertainty. I mean, come on, this is all we've done is follow you and now I have no idea what's gonna happen after this. Yet he says, I am going, don't let your hearts be troubled. Where, where are you going, Lord? In the second verse, he says, my father's house. That's where he's going. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus is going home. He's going home to his father's house. Now, when I was in college, going home, now that was a pretty sweet deal. I loved the idea of going home because when I went home, that meant I was gonna have clean laundry that was good. Going home meant that I was going to get the food that I loved because my mom was going to make it. Or at least I was going to go to a restaurant that I certainly couldn't afford on my own. Going home meant that I had someone waiting for me with open arms to welcome me in, someone who had invested their time and their life in me. And I knew that I was going to be loved because home was where I learned who I was. Home was the place where I learned to be strong, where I learned to believe the things that I believed, to think for myself. Home was a great place. Children had this uh, innate instinct to go home. You see it, you know, when a father or mother sits down on a chair, where is the first place that the child goes? I'm gonna crawl up into my parents' lap and I am going to snuggle in and I am going to be comforted because that is a great place of peace and love. I'm going home. Jesus was going home. Now, the Greek word that's used here is, is not the normal word for home. It wouldn't have been a, use that would, a word that would have used, been used to describe your home or my home. It was a word that was used only a few times in the New Testament, and it meant a heavenly dwelling. Paul actually used it again in 2 Corinthians when he said that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the house where Jesus was going. It was, it was God's dwelling. It was Jesus, it was um, where the Father was. And so Jesus was leaving. He was going to the Father's house. He was um, leaving the disciples, but he wasn't forgetting them because what did he say he was gonna do there? He said, well, I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. 
So the disciples hadn't been left, and actually, he's not even saying, I'm just making a place for the few of you who are right here. I'm making a place for you, and for you, and for you, and for you. This is not just a house, like a small house with a few rooms. This is a mansion. This is expansive. I am going to prepare a place for you and all of those who will come after you. I'm going home, but I'm preparing a place for you. And now this is where it gets really interesting. If you're the disciples and you're hearing this, this is starting to sound like maybe it's not too bad of a deal, right? He is leaving and that's not good, but he's going somewhere to prepare a place. And then he says this, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. But then he says something a little curious. He says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, you know the way. Now, if I'm a disciple and I'm hearing this, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, that doesn't really make sense because you just said you're going to the Father's house, you're going to prepare a place for me, and this is good, and then you're going to come back to actually take me there. So why do I need to know the way? Is that important? Do I need to know the way? The answer is yes. Because at this point, only Jesus knows the timeline. He knows this isn't a weekend getaway. He's not going to just go away for a month or, you know, six months and then come back. He is going to be gone for a really long time, and he has to have the disciples um, prepared to live life on their own while Jesus is gone. Of all of the speeches that Jesus makes to his disciples, I think maybe this is one of the most touching for me personally, because you can see that Jesus knows how hard this is about to be, and he wants to prepare these disciples. They've been following him. They've been learning how to live and how to love and how to serve, but he knows he's going to go away, and he wants them to be able to continue to live in the same way while he's gone. It's kind of like as my children have grown up, we have reviewed rules of the house over and over and over again. I've taught them how to think. I've taught them how to make decisions like I would make decisions because I want to be able to leave the house, leave them in the house and know that when I am gone, they're still going to live the way that they would if I were with them, even though I'm gone. So here's Jesus, and he goes, yes, you do need to know the way because I'm going to be gone, and I want you to live the same way, even if I'm not physically with you, the way we have been living together for the last three years. Again, the disciples are probably, you know, their head is spinning because they are dealing with the idea of separation anxiety and thinking back. Now, you just said a couple of us are really about to mess up here. Are we the reason why you're leaving? And when you leave, what's going to happen? Because um, I don't really know the plan, and I'm not sure I can do this on my own. And Jesus said, it's okay. But I love Thomas. Because everyone is sitting there and they're thinking and they're not saying anything, but Thomas opens up his mouth to ask the question that everyone wants to know the answer to. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answers, I am the way. I am the way, Thomas. I'm the way. You guys have been following me. You have lived the way I've lived. You have loved the way I've loved. You have served the way I've served. I'm the way. Just keep following me, just as if I were right here with you. I'm the way you're going to live and the way you're going to love and the way you're going to serve. And then the rest of that I am statement is the tools that they're going to need to know the way. So I am the way 
and the truth and the life. You're gonna know the way because you know the truth. You're gonna know the way because you share my life. You're gonna know the way because you know the truth and just hours later, Jesus is going to be in a garden and he is hours away from being arrested and he is praying to his father and this is what he prays. Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. So you're gonna know the way because you know the truth. You know my father's words. You've been growing up hearing his stories your entire life. You've been walking with me for three years hearing what the father has to tell you. You know his truth. If you know his truth, if you know his words, then you have hope and assurance. Don't you remember the story of Abraham? You know the story, the, the father who probably had to face one of the most difficult, heart-wrenching decisions of any parent where he had to take his son to go sacrifice him. And yet, the words of God must have been echoing in his head. The words that say, I am your shield, I am your great reward, I am your provider, I will not leave you, I am faithful. Sure enough, in Abraham's greatest hour of need, God provided. There was the ram in the thorns, the sacrifice that was needed. This is God's truth. They have hope and assurance in the word of God. They know the truth, so they know the way. They also know the Father's heart because in God's word, they have been hearing and memorizing and speaking God's word over and over again. Words that say, you are my child, you are the heir, you are my beloved, you are created in a new life. You have been set free. You are not condemned. I love you. These are the words that they have learned by knowing God's truth. And so, since they know the truth, since they've been grounded and rooted in God's word, in God's truth, then you can be built up strong in his truth. And as you grow strong in his truth, you can bear fruit in your life. But you've got to know his truth. The disciples needed to know his truth. Those who had been following Jesus needed to know God's truth. We need to know God's truth. If you are not spending time in God's word every week, gosh, it'd be great, every day, then how will you know God's truth in your life? How will you be rooted and grounded in the truth so that you know the way? The key to knowing the way is to know his truth. Now, knowing your way somewhere can be really important. And I'm just gonna pretend like we're in a loving environment. Are we in a loving environment right now? Sort of, thank you very much, Mary. Um, you know, so that I am just going to be able to bear my soul to you and be honest with you when we're talking about knowing the way somewhere. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm directionally challenged. I know, thank you, you're affirming me, I'm feeling affirmed, this is, like, like I'm not just a little directionally challenged, I'm a lot directionally challenged. The only good part about this whole thing is that I have a really, really good friend who's worse off than me. So I'm feeling a little better, but um, our husbands get together and laugh about us all the time. It's okay, we're laughing at ourselves also, it's all right. I mean, I can read a map. I can follow GPS, I am good to go. But if I don't have those things, like if you take me and drop me in a neighborhood and um, just say, hey, go north, what? I don't know what that means, okay? It's like, you know, when you're a child and you put the um, blindfold on and then you spin the child around and you say, hey, go pin the tail on that donkey? I'm like, I'm the one over here. Like I'm off the grid completely. Um, just last week, I was supposed to be at a pastor's dinner on time, and I'm like, I love 
being on time somewhere. So uh, I was headed there, and so I had to go to a house. It's a member here. I've been to this house multiple times before. For some reason, I got into a neighborhood. The GPS went out. I'm freaking out because I can't get there. I'm going to be late. And I'm calling my husband going, where am I? And how do I get there? Bless him. And he told me. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, so knowing the way is key because guess what? If you don't know the way, it's really easy to get lost. And Jesus says, I am the way because I am the truth. And he's given you this truth, not just so you can have head knowledge, just not so you can write some academic paper on what his truth is. He's given you his truth so that you can not only explain it, but so you can experience it. He's given you the truth so that you can experience life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know the way because you know the truth. You know the way because you share life. You know, it's interesting, this passage, this I am statement that we're reading, um, a lot of times people just pull this out and read it and study it only when they want to know where they're going to go when they die. But you know what? This passage is not about death. It's about life. It's about living a life in Christ every single day. It's about living like he lived, loving like he loves, serving like he served. A few weeks ago, Mark was teaching on I am the vine. And I loved that passage because I think that I am statement and this I am statement are so interconnected. And Mark was talking about, I am the vine and you are the branches and so you abide in me. And so if you abide in Christ, you have this life that is indwelling and it's enduring and it's this personal communion with Christ. It's, it's living life in Christ. And he actually shared one of my very favorite passages. It's uh, the Psalm 1. And I want us to look at Psalm 1 again, but I want us to look at it in light of this I am statement. So Psalm 1 begins, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. That's I am the way. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who uh, meditates on his law day and night. I am the the truth. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. I am life. Charles Spurgeon says, a little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but a great faith will bring heaven to your soul. This I am statement is not about us getting into heaven, it's about heaven getting in to us. And I know sometimes that just seems inconceivable. It seems like that's so much easier said than done because we do live in a world that has such darkness. We face that darkness all the time, whether it's listening to the news or sharing a prayer request with people around us or living that darkness ourselves. We live in a life, in a world that needs Christ's light and Christ's life. We want a new life in Christ. We're excited to find out that there is a way to share his life. Don't you love being able to invite people to church and say, you gotta come to my church because there is life there. We love my church because you gotta come and we've got programs, we've got dinners, we've got music, we've got all sorts of things in, in my church. You've got to come because that's where Christ is moving. You can see Christ's life at work there in my church. Well, the people who were following Jesus, the early Christians, they wanted to be able to show people Christ's life also. They didn't have a church to bring him to. They They couldn't say, hey, come sign up for this program. They were the church. 
to show people Christ's life. They had to live Christ's life in them. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We just sang that in the song, Possible. Who moves the mountains? Jesus within me. That's what we're talking about, about knowing the way. You know the way because you share the life of Christ. Those who've been following Jesus, just like the disciples, moving from one city to the other city, following him, they followed him all the way to Jerusalem as he entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And the large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They were following Christ because they wanted to know the way. They wanted to share life in Christ. When we were in Costa Rica, our team had the privilege of sharing God's truth of sharing God's stories with the children. And we did this in several places. And so we would would gather the children around us and, and we wanted to tell them the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And so Cynthia would start telling the story of the one sheep that wandered away and and how the shepherd would come and and find that one sheep and gather him up and bring him back and the children's eyes would get so wide. And then we would tell the story of the woman who lost the coin, who put everything else aside in her life to go searching for the one coin that was lost. And the children got so excited and were celebrating as Amy picked up the coin that had lost and she held it up and they celebrated. And then we told the story of the lost son. We told the story of the father how the father had been waiting and watching for his son, how the father had been wanting his son to come home so desperately. And as we told the story, the children just leaned in to hear God's words. And we told the story about how the father looked and far off saw the son and the son came running to the father and the father went running to the son and he grabbed him and he put his cloak around him. He put his feet, his shoes on his feet and ring on his hand and he took him home again. The son knew that the best place to be was the father's house the children hearing the truth of God knew that the best place to be was the Father's home. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for each of us. And He has given us His truth. He says, I am faithful, I am worthy. And He has given us His life of grace and love and mercy. And he gives us the invitation to come home. As we come into a time of prayer, I want you to know that if you wanna come home today, if you want someone to pray with you, to tell you more about God's love for you, Mark's gonna be on this side, I'll be on this side. Um, There are spots up here in the altar, you can just come and pray and be with the Father. He has come, He is the way, and you know the way because you know His truth and you share His life. 
Let's pray. Father God, we just give you thanks for all the truth that you have given us in your word, that you remind us over and over again that you, we are your children and you love us and all you want is for us to come home. Father, it is in your name that we pray.